welcome to the third installment of the Tufts faculty webinar series. The Tufts University Alumni Association is proud to host this unique series, which provides lifelong learning opportunities for our alumni, parents, and friends around the world. We will be offering live one-hour webinars throughout the academic year on relevant topics delivered by some of our most dynamic faculty members. For all our attendees, your audio has been turned off to eliminate any disruption from background noise. Additionally, please note that you cannot view the other participants who have logged in. If you would like to ask any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the lower right portion of your screen. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Professor Margie Skier, who will be discussing how to talk with kids about drug and substance use. Thank you very much for everybody who's attending. I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm going to be speaking today about talking with children about alcohol and drugs, and specifically the timing and also some tips and ideas on and strategies about how to do it. So before I start talking about all of that, I want to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got to where I am. Um, so when about 20 years ago, I was interning at a drug rehabilitation center and was working one on one and in groups with young people, particularly 18 to 20 year olds, who at the time were not that much younger than me. And they were struggling with recovery from addiction to primarily heroin. And I was I became very invested in these people and in their paths and heard a lot about uh, their adversity in their families and what happened to them when they were kids in their families with their peers that led them to this uh, to disordered substance use and to even starting to use substances in the first place. So I decided to pursue a degree in clinical social work and continue working with this population around addiction and found that sort of a very similar story emerged a lot around the family environment, adversity, and uh, using substances as a coping strategy. So what I found was that it was extremely uh, difficult time listening to these stories day in and day out. And I decided that I would like to actually work on the prevention side of this. And so that's why I decided to pursue a doctorate and focus on prevention and intervent, uh, designing interventions. Um, and so that's what I do. I got a degree in social epidemiology in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health and did a two year postdoctoral fellowship at the Brown Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies to really focus on substance use and prevention. And so that's what um, I'm working on now and primarily working on with parents and guardians, how you actually communicate with kids about this particular topic. So I'm going to talk, um, just to give you a little bit of background, why is this an issue? So we know currently, so this is current data as of this year, among 12th graders, 60, about 60% 60 have ever had alcohol and almost one in three currently drink. That means that they've had alcohol and that's more than just a sip, that's a whole drink uh, within the past month. And almost 18% have been drunk in the past month. And this is also typical for teenagers, for high school students. We know that when they drink, they're not drinking to sort of relax at the end of the day with a glass of wine. If they're drinking, they're often drinking to get drunk. Uh, it's just what's fun and that's why, and that's what they're doing it for. Um, I'm sorry, this is not 4%. It's, uh, I believe it's 40% have used marijuana in the past year or 34%, or but it's high. It's about one in three. Um, but 6% report daily use. And that's really important. And I'll talk a little bit about that later with respect to brain development. But 6% of high, of high school seniors are reporting using marijuana every single day. And almost half are reporting vaping in the past year. And uh, most are vaping nicotine, but they're also vaping flavoring and marijuana. It is also important to note that when teens talk about vaping flavoring, there's actually still usually nicotine in the pods that are just flavoring. So they are still actually vaping nicotine when they even just think that they're using uh, flavoring. 
And so why is this an important period? Why is adolescent risky? Why is adolescence risky? It's during this time in their lives that young people start giving more weight to the payoff associated with risk than adults do. And it's because their brains are kind of wired in that way. Uh, the way they develop is sort of from the back to the front. And the back part is more reward, um, pleasure, excitement. And then it's more the front part of the brain that's around decision making and uh, the pieces that as adults, we find that we can access more readily. They are, this is also, again, related to brain development, a time that they're looking for sensation. So they do more sensation seeking. And it's also during this time of around teenage years that peers become very important. And so when we think about puberty, it's around puberty that the brain actually starts this massive restructuring. And around puberty too is when parents start becoming less important to kids. Up until then, you may not think so, but parents are actually the most important people in their kids' lives. Their brains, again, are sort of wired to turn to their parents more and to take that stuff in more than friends. And yet around puberty, this shifts and it's a developmentally appropriate time. It actually should happen where it's important that it happens for lots of different reasons. But this is when peer, you know, around puberty, as in the teenage years, peers start becoming very important. And teens are responding to social reward among their, among their peers. And peers are also way more novel. And again, teens' brains are sort of wired to seek out novelty. And so you're the tried and true, but they're more exciting. And so we see that in the brain, this is actually the thinning of gray matter, which is greater in the red and yellow regions and lower in the blue and purple. And this has to do with the way that the brain is developing from age five to age 20, age 20 and um, has to do with information processing and learning and memory and all of these things that are becoming more, much more efficient as young people get older. And I sort of like to think of the adolescent brain as like a baby giraffe. So if you've ever seen a giraffe being born, calves, they sort of, they are born from their mother, then they sort of have to stand up immediately and start walking and they're kind of fumbling around. So their bodies are there, they have the capability to do it, but it's really, they, they're not exactly sure what to do with their bodies. And brain, the adolescent brain is sort of similar. So it's all there, but they're not exactly sure what to do with it just yet. So it's going through this restructuring and it's sort of getting there, but the adolescent brain is not just an adult brain that's not quite mature. There's a lot that's going on with it. And during this time, what's happening is um, this restructuring that I talked about, they, their brains are starting to become more efficient, but what that means is there's all of this sort of development, but also sloughing off of uh, neurons and connections that aren't being solidified. So as young people, again, puberty is a, a prime time for the learning and development as up until the finishing of this restructuring, which happens um, starting puberty, ending around mid to late 20s, even early 30s, we're finding uh, that what, what young people are doing over and over again, these connections in their brain get solidified. And neuroscientists call that neural sprouting. So these connections are getting, they're developing, they're getting stronger and they're solidifying. So when young people are doing things every single day, those are the connections that stick. So if we think about why it's helpful to start learning an, a language at a young age, this is why. The more that you do something, the, the stronger those connections get and they get solidified in the brain over time. So if they're doing you know, strong in academics and sports, uh, musical instruments, video games, if they're spending a lot of time doing video games, those are the connections that are going to get hardwired. And sort of the converse is that what they're not doing actually kind of goes away. And that's called neural pruning. So these connections that maybe are slightly made or are just kind of there, but they're not being reinforced, go away. 
And so it's not that you can't develop a skill later in life, but it makes it much, much harder. And that's why focusing on this time in, in life is really important because we know that substances start to actually change the brain. And like I said before, when 6% of 12th graders are using marijuana every single day, those are the connections that start getting hardwired in the brain. And that's why it's really important that we prevent and delay. And in part, we know that one in 10, uh, sorry, nine out of 10 people with substance related problems started using before the age of 18. And this is in part because of what I just talked about, about the brain, because we start use the earlier you start using, the more you're sort of uh, working against this, uh, the structure of the brain and the way that all of these connections are being hardwired. And so if we can actually push young people and we can delay their initiation, their brains are going to be better off and they're going to be less likely to become dependent and addicted to other substances down the road. And we know that with young people, perceived harm is related to use inversely. So as you see over time from 75 to 2017, as the perceived harm of marijuana use goes up, use patterns go down. And um, similar, vice versa, as perceived harm goes down, use patterns go up. And we see that with all sorts of substances. We see that with prescription drugs, where that's a substance a lot of young people start using because it's prescribed by a doctor, because it's in a medicine cabinet. The perceived harm is much lower than other substances. Um, alcohol, too. If it's in the home, if it's unlocked, perceived harm is lower. And we're seeing that more now with marijuana use, particularly around legalization of recreational marijuana. As perceived harm goes down, use goes up. So um, this is all part of what I was talking about as well. In addition, like I said, delaying onset of substance use actually reduces the risk of uh, using illicit drugs or other illicit drugs and uh, dependence over time. So what this graph shows us is that on the bottom is the age of alcohol onset, the age that um, people started using. And this is among a sample of about 30,000 people over the age of 18. And we see that for each year that we can delay them from starting to use alcohol even, there's actually, it goes down, you can see this sort of dose response relationship with the age of drinking onset and later drug use and even dependence and addiction. So if we can get young people to not start using alcohol until the age of 21, we almost, it would get almost sort of get rid of later disordered use. And that doesn't uh, address genetic uh, predisposition and whatnot, but it is a, it, this is a very profound slide because well, we know that people are starting to use alcohol at earlier ages, and it, uh, it, there is a direct link with um, other drug use and substances over time. We're seeing this too right now with vaping, because vaping nicotine in particular is extremely popular and sort of highly prevalent among middle school students. So this is something we talk about, oh, I have time, this is not happening right now. But middle school, eighth grade, eighth grade is about 13, 14, even when young people start using nicotine, it actually primes the brain for later addiction. So they think, oh, this isn't a big deal. I, I vape some, I vape nicotine, their brain, if they become dependent and addicted to it, it actually starts creating those pathways and changes the structure of their brain that primes them for later addiction. So it's not just alcohol. Okay, so that's the why is this important. And um, I wanted to spend a little time just talking about prevention. So what is prevention? And when I give a talk in it live, I often ask people, so what is the definition of prevention? In the field of health and medicine, we talk about prevention all the time. We are constantly talking about, you know, prevention, an ounce of prevention is, a, is it worth a pound of cure, and we need to prevent this, we need to prevent that, but we don't really define it. And when I ask people what is the definition of prevention, 
I inevitably hear somebody say, um, I inevitably hear somebody say, well, it's stopping something bad from starting, which is true in part, but that is not what, when I think about prevention, uh, there's a go-to definition that, that I always sort of think about, and I wanted to share with that with you. So the Center for Substance Abuse Pre um, Prevention within the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a federal agency, defines prevention as a proactive process that empowers individuals and systems to meet the challenges and life events of life events and transitions by creating and reinforcing conditions that promote healthy behaviors and lifestyles. And I want to break this down for you a little bit more about why this is my go-to definition. Because you will notice there's nothing in this definition about stopping something bad from starting, and it's really about promotion. This also even though it is from the S Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, there's nothing about substance use in particular in this definition. So it's really about sort of large scale prevention. And the work that I do when thinking about prevention, especially among young people, so we're thinking elementary school, which is a, a lot of my uh, prevention work is starts, you know, even late elementary middle, a lot of the techniques and stuff that we do is really kind of across the board preventing lots of different outcomes. So thinking about substance use, violence, um, dating violence, uh, sexual risk, academic problems, you know, a lot of these skills uh, really kind of translate across the board. But this definition of pro prevention, so let me break it down a little bit. So. Prevention is a proactive process. This is not something where we're sort of sitting around waiting, you know, for somebody to say something. We actually need to be proactive about it. And in thinking about the work that I do around talk, ha having parents and guardians talk with their kids about substances, this is one of the hardest pieces that I've found is that parents will often say, I know I should, I know I need to, but I just don't know how, or I don't know when. And that's why it's so important that because this is a proactive process, when um, a lot of times parents will say, oh, my kid's a good kid. Uh, they're not going to do it. I don't need to talk about it. It's sort of waiting in the wings for that something, you know, crossing your fingers, hoping that something is not going to happen. But saying, well, if I talk about it, then it's going to introduce it to them. And the science shows that's not true at all. We actually need to be proactive. So. Prevention is a proactive process that empowers individuals and systems. So we think about teens, we think about young people, or even all of us, we, we do not live in silos. We live in contexts. And so we are individuals nested within our, our families, our friend group, our schools, our work, our communities, our society, our policies. And those all interact with each other to affect individual behavior. And so we are, if we think about teens, they're individuals within these larger systems. And so the prevention really doesn't only work at the individual level. It works at these all these different levels. So to meet the challenges of life events and transitions. I bring this up because transitions are points in people's lives sort of all across the life course that are higher risk. And transitions are anytime there's sort of a change in status quo. And transitions can be good and they can be challenging. But if examples of tradition of transitions in people's lives are anytime, you know, if there's children go from, you know, start kindergarten or go from elementary to middle school or high school, graduating high school, uh, leaving school, going to college, getting a license, so when there's more independence. Even if there's not a car, there's a, a, an independence that can happen. Um, marriage, divorce, changing jobs, retiring. Again, some of these are really good and positive, and yet we have to be mindful that change can be challenging, even if it is good. So when a kid goes from you know, eighth grade in middle school to ninth grade in a new high school, there are all sorts of challenges and changes that come along with that, and we have to be mindful of that, that that's a period of higher risk. And then finally, that these are, we want to meet the challenges of these life events and transitions by creating and reinforcing conditions that promote healthy behaviors and lifestyles. So this is about promotion. 
again, nowhere does it say let's stop the bad things from happening, but let's actually promote the healthy behaviors. So because if we really only started from a place of promotion, we'd probably be a lot better off. And we live in a world now where we're seeing the opioid epidemic and so much attention is paid toward the treatment, which we absolutely need 100%. But we weren't paying as much attention in the beginning that led to what we're now seeing around opioids. Okay, and the other piece that I wanted to convey around this is that knowing is not enough. When I ask people again, what's the definition of prevention, often I get education. And in public health, people first sort of think, we need to tell people what they're doing is wrong. And we know from science that knowing something, knowing something is not good for you is not enough. Because how many people who smoke cigarettes currently know that it's not good for them? I'd say the majority. Some people might believe otherwise, but the majority of people know that smoking is not good for them. And yet there are lots and lots of reasons and good reasons that they do it. Um, addiction is a primary one. But, or how many people who eat fast food very frequently sort of know it's not good for them? Most people or a lot of people probably do. Again, there are lots of reasons that people do it. It tastes really good, it's consistent, it's inexpensive. There are lots and lots of reasons. But just, we, we just need to tell people it's, it's bad for them does not work in this field. And so, like I said, context matters. You know, if we think about the, our, ourselves in this sort of social ecological context, we are individuals in, this, in our, these larger contexts and, and teens nested within their families are really a salient one for them. Again, especially as they're younger, particularly as that transition goes to their peers becoming more important. And this has to do too with why starting these conversations is younger than you think, because you have a window where what you say matters more than later. So I wanna talk a little bit about the family environment. Um, we know that the family environment can be an extremely effective one when it comes to substance use prevention. Lots of different um, levels of the social ecological model, again, peer-based interventions, school-based uh, policies are, can all be very effective. But I focus a lot on the family. Uh, and like I said, because of what the stories that I had heard time and time again when I was working one-on-one -on -one with people. And the family environment and thinking about what's actually protective about the family environment, because what I had heard about was a lot of adversity, but there are a lot of components of the family environment that can be extremely effective in preventing substance use and other risk among young people. So we know that open communication is a very, very important and effective strategy and communicating specifically about substance use and expectations we know is effective. But open communication period is important for this because first of all, you need to be able to have a baseline level of communication with kids, um, because if you really feel uncomfortable even asking them about their day, and I have worked with parents who have said, I do not feel comfortable asking my child about their day or about their friends. It was cultural, but there are families where they don't, they don't know how to talk to their kids, especially as they become teens, and that, that communication can become more challenging. But you can't go from zero to 100 of, like, let's talk about I, you know, I don't feel comfortable talking to you about sort of much, but now let's talk about things like alcohol and vaping and drugs and sex and all the other things that come along with these kind of conversations. So having that sort of open dialogue and having kids a lot, um, feel comfortable coming to you to have these conversations is really critical so that when you, when it comes time to actually have these more challenging conversations, you have, you've set the stage for it. So we know open communication is a very effective strategy. We also know that family meals is an effective strategy. So family meals reduces the risks of smoking, drinking, and other drug use during youth. Um, we also know that family meals are not actually made a priority. And when people talk about family meals, 
I sort of have my own definition of what a family meal is after having done research in this topic for the past 10 years. And for me, it's not actually the meal itself. Around when we think about risk and risk prevention, it's not you know, what you're eating. And it's actually not even the eating, but there are lots of reasons why the family meal is, a, is something that can confer protective, a, a protective effect. Um, but my definition of family meals is where one child and one parent, guardian, grandparent, whoever's caring, caretaker, uh, whoever's caring for the child is there. And if one of them's eating, fine, that's a family meal. It doesn't have to be this sort of, sort of perfectly, you know, orchestrated thing where all of, everything is like perfectly healthy or perfectly um, put out on the table. It's just that you're there, but that you're there and that you're actually paying attention and you're not on a device and the television's not distracting or a telephone isn't distracting, but you're actually sitting there paying attention to each other and talking. Because of all the pieces that are important about meals, it's, it's actually that time to connect. It, didn't, it wouldn't matter if you said at you know, 8.30 every morning, we're just gonna sort of take a walk and we're, we're gonna connect during that time and talk. It's gonna give you the same impact um, because it's really the dedicated time that you spend talking with your kids and making them aware that you you are carving out that time and you want to hear it from them and listen to them. Dinners are seen as a meal that's actually can be a little bit better only because it's at the end of the day, you can talk about the day rather than at breakfast, usually you're talking about what's going to happen during the day. Breakfasts are often rushed with activities and school. So dinner can be seen as that time where everybody can be together if it's made a priority and really reflect on what's happened during the day. Um, but it's really not made a priority in many ways. Uh, but if it's possible to eat meals together, it is a wonderful strategy. If it's not possible, again, it's finding that 20, 30 minutes every day in some capacity to connect, whether it's a ride to school now, a lot of parents will say too, well, the ride to school is shot because my teen is now on their phone. So if that's not the time, then fine, don't make it the time. But it's it's not the meal, but it's that it's the time to connect that really matters. And the way that I got sort of involved in this research was um, in thinking about meals. I was, it was about 20 years ago and I was watching TV, actual live television, on a, a television that was very similar to the one that you see on your screen. And I saw a public service announcement that said, what, um, that said, if you want to prevent your child from using substances, the best thing you can do is eat dinner with them. And there was this whole scene about somebody walking through a dining room and then walking to the kitchen and opening the oven and pulling out a turkey and you know, saying, this is the best thing you can do. And I remember thinking, is that true? Could that be, is that possibly something that is a legitimate association? And so I started doing research into it and I found that there was actually a lot of evidence showing that this strategy, the frequency of family meals is, uh, is impactful for these different risk outcomes. And it's also something that's being sort of um, addressed as like, you know, by the lay community. So this is an, uh, a letter that was sent home, this is in 2016, August, where a second grade teacher, Brandy Young, at um, an elementary school in Texas, sent home this letter to parents saying, after much research, I'm trying something new. I'm actually not gonna give your kids homework. The second paragraph, research has been unable to prove that homework improves student performance. Rather, I ask that you spend your evenings doing things that are proven to correlate with student success eat dinner as a family on top of other things. So this is something that we actually see a lot that, that people are sort of promoting as a, as a prevention and sort of overall wellness um, strategy. And, and we know that there's actually science behind it. So I talked a little bit about um, why meals are important. Like I said, it's not what happens at the meal and it's communication. But it's also, like I said, it's the time where you're actually showing your kids. And, and it doesn't have to be said, and they don't even have to notice it, but that consistency matters that every day or five days a week or even two days a week, you're setting that time aside. 
because you want to actually hear from them. And it's also a great time to start uh, really detecting patterns in your kids. So if you start noticing things sort of changing, they're talking about different friends, they're wearing different clothes, sometimes you can have lots of conversations without saying anything with within your family because you're talking about activities, you've got this going on or what are you gonna have for lunch or what's going on after school or what are you gonna do this weekend, but you're not actually connecting. And so understanding those patterns sometimes, you need to sort of sit down and, and look and listen. And those can be really helpful if there's some sort of risk that pattern that's starting to emerge. And so when we think about talking with kids about substances, so that's meals, open communication, and then talking with kids about substances is known to be an effective strategy around prevention. And so this um, is really about talking with kids about substances, talking about your expectations. So we know that kids who have conversations with their parents about substances are 50% less likely to use these substances. That's a huge, huge difference. And this is even among parents who are um, sort of feel like I use a substance of smoking, I smoke, I, I'd be a hypocrite if I told you not to. There's actually evidence that shows among parents who smoke cigarettes, those who tell their kids, I don't want you to, even though I do, these are my expectations and I don't want you to for these reasons, they are way less likely to initiate smoking than their peers who parents say, I'd be a hypocrite if I told you not to. So even, you know, modeling behavior is really important, but this communication and setting uh, expectations is, we know is critical. And sort of like I said, when I'm thinking about brain development, teens actually care what their parents think. Um, it, they, parents may not think that, and yet it's true. So this is, you know, the parent, this image, parent talking, the, the teen being you know, disgruntled and grumpy. And yet when parents disapprove of and, and convey their expectations, the teen is actually less likely to use substances. And when parents are tolerant of, of substance use, it actually increases the chances that their kids will use. And so a, a question I get a lot is, is if I want my kid to sort of drink in a healthy way, my 17 year old, they're gonna be going to college soon or they're gonna be leaving the house. And I wanna sort of teach them how to drink in a way that's not gonna be dangerous for them. Um, and I do it at, at home, right? It, I think that's gonna be better, is that true? And this, the evidence and science shows that actually what uh, the expectations we give for our kids is what they're likely to be to rise to. So if our expectations are very low and we say, we expect you not to drink at all. On average, this is where they're going to go. They're going to just go up to the low point. If we start making allowances and we say, well, you can drink in these circumstances, they're going to come up to here. If we said, it's fine for you to drink as long as you don't drive, that's what they're going to do. So whatever the expectations that we set, again, you're going to have kids who, who, you know, you set your expectations low and they're not going to listen to them. But we know that generally the the expectations that parents set in a communicative and open way. This isn't a wagging your finger. Don't do this because I told you not to. That's not open and communicative. That's sort of an authoritarian way of doing something. We know when parents are authoritar authoritative, they provide warmth, but also structure and expectations. Those kids are less likely to use substances. So some parents feel more comfortable giving their kids alcohol in their home, but they will drink and it does affect their brain. And in terms of talking to kids about substances, like I said, it can be very uncomfortable. I know parents, a lot of times parents and guardians will say, I, I know I should, but I don't know how. But I, I really like this ad from British Columbia. It says, they can talk to your kid about alcohol or you can. It's going to come up. If you don't talk to them about it, they will hear about it from their friends. They will hear about it from peers in school. They will be at a party where people are drinking or they will be exposed to it in some way. So they will get the information. The nice thing about when you actually have these conversations, you get to control the content and you get to control the question and answer period as well. 
So I wanted to give you a few tips and strategies that um, I have, have shown to be you know, effective in trying to have these kind of conversations. So the first is I wanted to tell you the secret to having the talk, right? So we, we hear a lot, a lot about um, I need to have the talk. A lot of times people talk about the sex talk or I need to talk about the talk with alcohol and drugs. And the secret is it's actually not a talk. This is not a one-time conversation. This is a conversation that needs to start, and you start early, and it actually needs to happen more than one time. And so if you think about something like children watching a movie, you might, if, you, if you've had kids and they're younger, you, you see that they can watch the same movie over and over and over and over again ad nauseum. And you sit there going, oh my God, you're going to watch that movie again? You've just now seen it. You saw it yesterday, you saw it three days ago, and you're going to watch it again. How can you possibly watch this movie again? But the interesting thing about sort of kids and the way their brains are developing is that they can only take in small pieces at a time. So every time they watch a movie, they actually get a different piece. Whereas adults, our brains are developed and we watch a movie and get most of it. And maybe we can watch it a second time, but a lot of times we're sort of, you know, watching it the second and third and fourth time if we do for enjoyment because it was so exciting for us rather than trying to get more out of it. But they get more out of it that each time they watch a movie. And so with these kind of conversations, the more you have these conversations, they're gonna get bits and pieces each time. If we want kids to develop a skill, we don't do it with them one time. We don't say you're learn. Okay, we're going to teach you a math concept. Here's the concept. Now I expect you to do it and practice it and integrate it into your life. We practice with them. We teach them. We show them different ways. We need to do the same kind of thing with talking to them about substances. And the more and the earlier you start, the more natural it can become when these things come up over the years. And so it's younger than you might think. And oftentimes I'll ask people, how old do you think you should start talking to kids about substances? And um, a lot of times, you know, 12, 13, 14, right, sort of tween years. And it's actually nine. Science says, American Academy of Pediatrics says that the age nine is the age we need to start talking to kids about alcohol and other drugs. Because according to the Monitoring the Future study in 2018, about one in four eighth grade students have used alcohol, with almost one in 10 reporting it in the past month. So we sort of think we have time. It's not going to be till we're 17. It's actually, they start earlier than you think, and we need to have these conversations earlier than you think. And so when we think about, well, OK, so maybe they're not going to start till eighth grade. Then I have some time. But in the spirit of you as parents being the more important people in their lives now, then you want what you're going to say to sort of stick in the back of their head that when you are no longer the, import, the most important person, when their friends are, that they know what your expectations are and that they've heard this conversation many different times. And they can, again, in the same way you start talking to them about it at nine, they're going to get different pieces like, like watching a movie multiple times. Okay, so how do we start this conversation? This is a thing, like I said, I think parents really struggle with. It's uncomfortable, I don't know kind of where to start, how to, how to start. And I would say even before you start, become a little bit more educated about the topics that you're gonna be talking about. So what do you need to know about alcohol? What do you need to know about vaping, cigarettes, marijuana? There are, if you can sort of sit down and become a little bit more educated, you'll feel more comfortable about knowing what's a, what's a prevalence, so what's a percentage of young people who are doing it. Um, what, you know, what do we know about how it affects the brain? What do we know about how it affects people's lives? And so then you can come armed with some of that information when you sit down to have these conversations. And it's important that you as a parent are the credible messenger. So if you start making things up because you think or you heard something and they find out that's not true, you've lost your credibility. So I've had, um, I had a parent-child conversation where uh, a child said, well, could you die of alcohol? And the mom said, well, 
uh, no, you'd probably pass out before, you know, if you drank too much, you'd probably just pass out. And, and I thought, well, this is actually not true. Um, and we need to make sure that we're giving them truthful information. So once you sort of feel comfortable with the content that you're going to be having these conversations, and there are wonderful websites online, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, CDC have lots of amazing resources for parents about what they should know when they're having these conversations. But in terms of having the conversation, you should try to take advantage of natural conversation starters. So for example, lots of schools are sending home information about uh, vaping with to families. So we want to know, um, OK, they're telling us that this is a problem in the school or that this is something we should be aware of. What do you know about it? Here, look at this letter I got. Have you heard anything about it? Let's talk. Or ask them what questions they have. Hey, I've been hearing a lot about vaping. And I, and I use vaping as the example because right now we are hearing it everywhere. So it could be alcohol, it could be marijuana. Um, with legalization in Massachusetts, you could say, hey, you know, did you hear about the new law? What do you know about it? What have you heard? What do you think? And another thing that I, um, that I think is really important is taking advantage and taking notice of the time where your child is most talkative. So I have an 11 year old and my child is most talkative at 915 at night when I want him desperately to go to bed. And so it's extremely challenging because he's really talkative. I, I want him to go to sleep. I want to do stuff that I need to do at the end of my day. And yet this is where it, when he's chatty. So there are times that I stop and I say, OK, he's talking. He wants to talk to me about his friends. He wants to talk to me about something that came up in school. Even though I try to do it at dinner when we have, you know, we, have, we try to have dinner every night, even though I try to do that, that's not, that's not in his terms. It's on my terms. So sometimes it's sort of stopping and thinking, how can we do this on our kids' terms? And so what you might say, you might say, I expect you not to drink alcohol, to vape, to whatever. Um, because like I said, teens and young people will often rise to their parents' expectations. But I don't want you to do these things because, right, it's not, again, a wagging your finger saying, you better not do this or else. It's a, let me explain to you why. So first of all, alcohol, vaping, everything for young people, teens, it's illegal. It's not good for your brain. You can talk a little bit more about that if you get more information. You could say, actually, you know, uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so, do you remember they had a problem with alcohol? It's in our family that actually increases your chances that it that could be a problem for you. Um, and the other thing that we want to do is help them practice. So let's think of the things that you might want to say if you're offered alcohol or anything, vape, you know, a, a vape device, especially with their young, if they're younger. And because we want to be able to give teens a menu of options, um, if you think about, if you've ever, as an adult, if you've ever given a presentation, you probably put the presentation together and then you practice it maybe once, twice, three, four, five times before you feel comfortable getting up in front of a group of people and giving the presentation. And in the same way, if we said to teens, here, just say no, and they're offered something, it actually doesn't give them the practice that we all like as adults. We need to give that to them too. And it might feel very sort of corny or hokey to do role playing with teens around this stuff, but it can be very effective when you say, okay, I want you to come up with the excuses or the reasons if somebody says, here, try this, why you might not want to. And then you they they come up with a list that's comfortable for them because what might what I might think is comfortable for them might not be. So we need them to have the comfort with it. And then we need to practice so that when the time comes, they're able to pull, right, I remember, right, this, this is comfortable for me. I've said this before. So one thing that comes up a lot is, so if alcohol is so bad, why do you drink it? You know, so maybe you drink wine or beer with dinner and um, there's, you know, lots of different reasons why you drink. And it's okay to have that conversation. And actually, it's probably a good conversation to have with kids. But why do you drink? Well, I drink because I like the taste of it. Um, I'm an adult, it's legal for me. And you know, sort of the, the reasons why you do. But the other thing is,
it's important to model good behavior. So if you're drinking a glass of wine or beer or something with dinner or at a party one or two, that's different than getting drunk because we also know that when teens have seen their parent get drunk one time, they're five more five times more likely to binge drink in high school. So it's that modeling behavior as well. But um, when you, you know, there are reasons why adults drink. And, and again, with marijuana, it being legal for those over 21, same thing, it's gonna come up. So these are the reasons if you do it and you do it in front of your child or if they know that you do, then um, it's something that you can have an open conversation about. And then the dreaded question, which is, did you drink when you were a teen? And this is, you know, one of the things that parents get very worried about because if they did drink or use marijuana or smoke when they were a teen, what do they say to their kids? And so it really, you should be focusing, talking to your kids um, about the negative consequences, sort of how to avoid authors, what the family rules are. But you can also be honest with them. We don't want the, the prevailing thought around this is that we don't want to lie to kids, um, especially if you say, oh, no, 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 I never ever did. And then they, you have a reunion. And so, you know, your friend from high school or college says, oh, when you're, you know, your mom and I back in college, we were drunk all the time, you know, you would hope they wouldn't do that, but that stuff does come up and you want to be honest and truthful. Again, you need to be a credible messenger. So if your parent said, if your child says, did you, when you were my age, did you X, Y, or Z? It, you want to be truthful. You can say yes, but you don't want to go into, oh, those are the glory, you know, old, the glory days, the best time of my life. I, you know, I wish I can go back there. That's, that's not what we want parents to do. We want them to tell them that, you know, were there negative things that happened or things that you sort of wish you didn't, you hadn't done. We also know way more about brain science now than we did 30 years ago. Um, we know how it, how it affects young people's brains. And we also know that, especially things like marijuana, are far more potent today than, we, than they were in the 70s and 80s. Um, even the stuff that's uh, manufactured for retail is so much more potent. And so um, you want to you know, anticipate what their response might be and prepare a response, but you know, you, you don't want to necessarily bring it up, but they ask, if they ask you, you should not necessarily, you know, you shouldn't lie, but don't go into sort of all the good things that happen. Um, but trust your instincts on this. So I want to leave a few minutes for questions. I, I have a, just a few slides about some research projects that I, my major research projects. I'll tell you in one minute about them, and then I'll um, get to some questions if you have any. So I um, have a large project that's funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It's a five-year study. It's called Supper Project, Substance Use Prevention Promoted by Eating Family Meals Regularly. Uh, I came up with this acronym and I was very proud of myself, sort of sitting in my office patting myself on the back. But this is really focuses on family meals um, and using family meals as a conduit for open communication and conversation about substances and uh, family engagement and connection. So I'm testing that as an intervention in Boston area schools with parents and guardians of fifth through seventh grade students. I also, um, these are picture, these are pictures from a marijuana dispensary in uh, Denver, sort of right before our policy change in Massachusetts. But I'm doing some qualitative research with parents and their high school age kids about their perceptions of marijuana as the legalization status has changed. And then finally, I'm actually doing some work around crystal meth use prevention in rural uh, North Idaho. Crystal meth is a drug that's particularly virulent and um, very prevalent up in rural uh, parts of the Northwest, but it also drastically affects the teeth. And so we're actually designing a, I'm working with a colleague to design a communication based strategy to prevent uh, crystal meth use by delivering content to teens, for hygienists to deliver content to teens in the dental setting. Hope you enjoyed our webinar today. As a reminder, for any questions in the Q&A box that were unaddressed, we will share as many answers as possible with you in an email.
This presentation has been recorded and will be available at a later date on our Tufts Alumni YouTube channel. You will receive an email shortly with the link to a brief survey. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey as we do value your feedback. Thank you for joining us today.